I'm going to talk about, yeah, about the FabLab Barcelona, about what we're doing in terms of, of using the machines for different kind of projects in different scales. And, and also, which is our larger vision in terms of, of, of the city scale, and which would be the implications of digital fabrication today. Um, I'm sorry to, to start with this kind of um, slide. It seems to be like it's going to be a boring lecture. Right? For sure, it won't, it won't be a history lesson. It's just like, I, I'd really like to make a comparison about the moment that we are today, living today. Uh, which I don't know that everybody's talking about you know, innovation, creativity, and so on. And we are really, I don't know, even the Mayans say that in, in about two weeks the world is going to end, it's going to change. Yeah, everything is going to change, blah, blah, blah. We have a lot of access to a lot of technologies, but we really don't know what is going to happen. And I think that's mainly, it, we are more or less in the same situation as we were in the 15th century when Gutenberg first invented the press or America was discovered. Imagine that. When America was discovered, it's just like, I don't know, some spaceship coming to, to Earth, or even if we find life in you know, another planet, it's more or less a similar thing, no? So a new world started, and it was like a, the starting of the Renaissance, in a way, no? And these people didn't know about it by that moment, no? Then we, we, if we make a jump of, of 200 years, and even after the, the Renaissance, something happened um, in, in, in the Northern Europe, um, you know, is is given to in the in the UK and the, the the invention of the steam machine and how and how it changed our relationship with it, how we created so far. No, and the medieval age, the the productivity was inside the cities in a very small scale, but then with the with the invention of of, of this the, the steam uh, engine, the the production was sta started to be localized in a different place from consumption. No, but in a really let's say kilometers, a few kilometers, but then, in the beginning of the 20th century, something big again happened, and and actually the the, the chain production changed again our relationship with production, and and those few kilometers maybe were even farther, and now we produce and uh, very very far away from what we consume, no? Which is it's really a change uh, of of a, of a mindset, no? This for for taking things from one side to another, we need to use big ships, uh, big boats. I, well, we're really close to Denmark. If I show this image in Denmark, maybe it's not so polite. But the thing is that we, we really need to fulfill our supermarket, supermarkets of stock for us to have like a lot of choices. No? We really need, need to find everything we need. And we all have different, uh, let's say, tastes. We uh, have different needs and so on. No? Um, the thing is that all this kind of, uh, let's say, historical evolution have led us to this, the world that we live today, no? that where the raw materials are taken in one side of the world and it's, they are sent to the other side of the world where, where they are converted in final products and then these final products were, went to consumption uh, centers, the consumption centers produce trash and this trash goes to the other side of the world. So we're using a lot of energy, a lot of, of, of resources to do that. No? And, and basically what we have done is that going from the Renaissance this idea of a renaissance meant to really after the, all this consumption model on how we really are going towards, um, I mean, it, I think that besides the, the, this uh, fact that we're using more energy, it's really that taking away production from consumption is that really we're taking knowledge out of ourselves, no? which is really the, maybe the, the, the major consequence of, 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 of where we are heading towards. No? Um, so. But something happened in the, um, there's something that happened in the, in the let's say in the middle uh, 20th centuries is, is that computers and the first computer numerical control machines were invented in the 50s, but they weren't really significant until um, they became uh, personal. No? So it, it wasn't until the 70s, late 70s where the computers became personal and, and were accessible for people to use it. And then with the invention of, of internet, we, we added to that uh, connectivity, which really means a, a big change again. And, and if we, you put now um, in, in that formula um, 3D printing, then we, have like a, we start to have like a lot of ingredients where it started to tell us that maybe something big is about to happen again. No? So I, I, I put this formula on, on and, and it's similar to the Gutenberg and Columbus discovering America and the steam machine formula. And in this case, is how personal computation, the 
in, in the incrementation of connectivity in the world through, in, in this case, through internet, and their personal production, when production gathers again consumption, is really changing, or, 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 or I think is, is, is going to be leading the, 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 the next model, if we, if we want to call it like that, no? So, a lot of um, newspapers, magazines, and Wired, Economist, and so on are talking about the new industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, and how we are going from the steam machine to the Fordism now to the distributed manufacturing system. No? And if we put to that formula also the, the production of energy, not distribution production of energy, then we're, we're really having now something very, very big. No? Imagine that we don't need to control anymore like the Middle East countries in order to get oil, in order to, get, to produce energy, or, or how the big nuclear plants or, 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 or the big carbon plants are, are producing energy, but with a, with a lot of environmental consequences. Now, the Jeremy Rifkin talks here that how solar energy, wind power energy, or even the hydro hydrogen energy can really convert us in a, in a single user, in a producer, of energy, and then we are talking about a new organization of economy itself. No, if you don't need to buy energy, if you don't need to buy goods, then what would you need to work for? No, yeah, what you would need to have money for? Um, then this is the model that we think that we are might be heading off. No, in in a way, it's kind of going back to the medieval age, but in a with high tech tools in a way, and furthermore, and more important is being connected with. Um, um, every part of the world, okay? So if we think about the medieval towns, and uh, they were inside the walls, and all the productivity was happening inside, but then the, the connection of the, of the transportation of information was very few between one town and the other. No? And what we're talking about here is that simultaneous connectivity with a whole network of, of, of production in the world. So then the world itself is a distributed manufacturing uh, facility. So for that to happen, we are developing um, the Fab Lab project, which uh, had started at the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT at the beginning of the, of, of the last decade. And, and, and it started as, a, as an accident, in, um, as an outreach project from, from, from the Center for Bits and Atoms that wasn't meant to be what is, what is today. The Fab Labs had started um, just as a like, co cooperation between MIT and uh, Afro -American, African American community in the center of, of Boston that had really strong linkages with, with Ghanaian communities in Africa. And then what, what, the, the, what the CBA did is just put a facility with machines to do workshops and to, and, to, and to teach people to produce things using just a laser cutter, a milling machine, or a, or a, um, or a router, um, and a, big, a, a big scale router. And then um, what happened is that this was converted into a kit, into a set of tools that you could put in a room as big as this, and then have the, give the people the, the means to produce their own technology and, and not to consume technology. You know? So basically, this is, this is the main idea. And there, in, instead of creating more uh, consumers of technology, you are giving the means to people to produce technology. And, and for that, um, let's say we, the, the Fab Labs are sustaining to, let's say, three pillars. And these are the, how you can use it as a platform for education and research, how you can use them as a platform for generating businesses and economy, and how you can use Fab Labs as a platform to generate social change and impact in local communities. Okay, so the the analogy mainly here is how it happened, how we went from, uh, let's say, from personal computers to personal fabrication. If you see here, this image is is the ENIAC in the 50s, and then this is mainly, uh, one of the first uh, uh, desktop computers in the 80s, and then how we can have a computer in our pocket, then. We have, if we make the same analogy, this is the beginning of the 20th century, the chain production of, 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 a, of a big car factory. This is one machine in one fab lab, as maybe half of this size. And then what, go, what are going to be these new tools for production, if they're going to be personal replicators of matter in, in the kind of a Star Trek thing. No? So, as I told you, it's just a set of tools that you put in a room, even smaller like this one, and then you can put it, if you can put it in, in Boston, you can put it everywhere in the world. And if you connect them, then, then you have like a, now a, a really strong community. You can, you can think about how the people using the same tools in, in one side of the world is really able to, to talk the same language with the same protocols to whoever inside this network. You know? 
I hope I have enough battery, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Do we want to borrow something? No, I have. Thomas? Ah. <laughs> you know, we figured most people would be using Macs, so we taped this to okay. the table. Thank you. I didn't see it. Okay. So, yeah, that's the thing. that the, the It's how we set up a common, a common uh, let's say, ground for processes and tools, and, and I'm able to talk to someone that is in the, in the rural India, or someone that is in Cape Town, or in the Arctic Circle in, in Norway, no? Um, and just by using the internet and, 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 and equipment that is less than 100K uh, US dollars, no? So these are fab labs. It's giving the means to, tool to, uh, giving the means to people, again, to produce these kind of technologies, in which can happen different applications, no? It's, it's, is it, 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 it's not only, let's say, big, big wood workshop, workshops. It's, it's, it's you having the ability to produce interactive technologies and with different appliances, and of course, things that you cannot find easily in a store or, or on, on the shelf. So these are the kind of projects that have been developing through the network. And this is a, a wireless antenna a network in, in Jalalabad in Afghanistan, um, and in which for a less than 20 US dollar antenna, you can build you can give access to internet to schools and hospitals in, in, in a large scale, let's say in an urban scale, these antennas can connect into, a, into ranges of uh, five to 10 kilometers. It means that you have access in one point and you can replicate the signal of internet in 10 kilometers away. Um, this is a 3D printer, a 3D printer developed in the, um, in the Fab Lab Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands. Um, these are just different set of tools that People um, are working in Barcelona. Is is working with making T-shirts, making uh, their own electronics. This is working in a quadcopter and or working in malls. Um, these are kids in Lima learning how to make their own solar lamps. And these are some of the projects developed. Uh, maybe Alex is going to talk about uh, after me about the prosthetics projects developed between the Fab Lab Amsterdam and the and the Fab Lab in Indonesia. So what a these are more or less the, the state of the network today. We, there are like around 150 nodes that are connected to internet and in which we share, again, the tools, but also we are now um, working in, the, in, in having not only the machines, but also having the ability of replicating the people. It means that we are developing our own educational program called the Fab Academy, where people get access to learn each one of the processes in the Fab Labs, and this is what is being built today. We are starting on January. But what I want to do now is, is talk about more in, in, in depth and in, in specifics into the projects that we are, we are working in the Fab Lab Barcelona that is located inside the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. Um, I'm going to talk about the different scales. So I'm going to start from the scale of a microcontroller or, or the scale of a single circuit board. And, and this uh, project specifically is, is called the Smart Citizen. And it's basically a project that was crowdfunded in, a, in, in, Barcelona, in, in, in Spain, in one platform similar to Kickstarter. And we successfully achieved the goal of, of, of having at least 8,000 euros, uh, almost 9,000 euros, to, to develop a sensor board uh, that was based on Arduino that each person can install in their balcony to measure the environmental conditions of their public space. This is it's called the smart citizen basically because right now everybody's talking about the smart cities and nobody is putting in the formula the people or the citizen. No? So Cisco and IBM are, developed, are saying, yes, we need, you need to invest in these big infrastructures, put this huge fiber optics cable and buy these super expensive sensors and put these super intelligent stoplights and drive less car, driverless cars and so on. So we say, really, we just need to think about the people being part participating in the city and giving the tools for the people to produce data, uh, information, and things into the city. So we started from this framework, um, and basically the smart city thing is that, is how we work in a platform that is both a hardware and software connected to give the tools to people to participate in the production of the city. In this case, we developed this small um, sensor board that really, it just have a Wi-Fi antenna, and, and you, you, it's low consumption. It means that you can connect it to just a, um, to a solar panel, to a small solar panel. And you can start to 
capture information and then program this antenna to get connected to your wireless or to your Wi-Fi in your house and then use it to put data online, okay? Um, with no extra uh, infrastructure cost. And I'm talking about uh, um, this, uh, this uh, sensor board this is more or less 150 euros. So the idea is that we think each balcony or, ch or, or each house of, of, of the people as a pixel in, this, uh, in the city, you know, and how they could, they could be like a data sources for the city. You know? um, and basically, this is connected also to not only the data itself and numbers, but how we can translate this data into something that people can understand. In this case, we linked that sensor board to an online platform that we're working now. This is the beta version. I can show it to you a little bit how it works. This is a smart cities in beta, and so we're think uh, now our nodes are in production actually, and and the idea is that each person can connect their nodes to to this platform, and then when you navigate, you can see the the node of your neighbor, and then you can start to see which is the behavior of that sensors and that data, you know, and start to compare it with yours and so on. And even you can start to say, okay, th maybe this node is wrong, and I can and I can say, okay, um, this is not proper. Not 152 degrees of temperature is not right. So if I c if I compare it to another node, then I start to see, okay, in Barcelona, in these specific parts are 16 degrees. That's another thing that we are adding resolution into the information that we have in the city. The contamination level that we might ha might have access today are. Are look, let's say the sensors are located in towers that are meters away from, uh, from the ground. So maybe you're going out into a bike, but the, con the contamination level that you're getting is from 30 meters high, not the level that you are exposed. No? So that's the smart cities. And I, I wanted to go through, that's the scale of a, of a microcontroller of, of, of data, let's say, no? that we are working. Then we go into, into a next scale um, that is implies architecture. In this case, we work with master students in, at the AC, in, in, in our fab lab. And then they work, in, you will see, no? in, in, in a different applications of digital fabrication, from interiors no? to fabricate this kind of, um, we call it like um, fake ceiling, no? um, that you can actually use it to decorate an interior part of a house or even to work into, into the scale of, of, of a wall, let's say. In this case, this is a work done by each one of the students in where we have a parametric wall and each one of them had to design a mold that was part of a wall. So if I, sh I want to show you a video here. So this is the process. I want to do something, wait a second. I don't know why always the zoom works so badly. I have to open in a different window. No. So again, these are master students working really near to the, to the machines, no fearing about them, and then just producing an architecture scale uh, project. No? In this case, uh, as I told you before, the, um, the parametric design of a wall allowed for us to have in, a, in, a different, in, in each a component of a wall to be differentiated. No, it's, different, it's very different from chain production. and We don't have to have similar um, let's say uh, uh, identical components of a, of, a, of a wall, so we can think of a wall in which, in which the, each one of the bricks is different. In this case, I'm going to. This is just a construction of a wall. If you see, it's a collaborative work of. master students. No? It's very funny because it's an architect learning how to make a wall, but not only make the wall, but make the brick of the wall. No? This is what they say. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's this, the scale of a wall. And then 
yeah, it says video. I put the video. And then we, we also working in the production of architecture in a different perspective. Not only if we think about traditional architecture, then we make them all. We have the foam work. Then we put the materials inside, and then we get the components, and, and then we, we, we make the building. In this case, um, the students were working on how to use not only this robot, but several of, of the machines of a, of a fab lab, and hack them, and use the machines as the, as the mean to produce architecture. In this specific case, they, they, it's very funny. Students of architecture, they were developing nozzles for 3D printers. No? And, and these um, couple guys that actually even are now creating a company that is called Fab Clay. And, and again, it's using the technology and for the production of architecture into a, into a very different perspective. No? So this is work that has been, can be thinking about uh, if you think about Enrico Dini or, or Berak Koshnevis, they have been working for uh, in this for years. Enrico Dini has a 3D printer that is maybe the size of this room, and he's printing big things like uh, sculptures and, and big furniture. No? In this case, what what the students achieve is actually to control the tools to to produce architecture to, through different levels. So the big change here is to to produce on on-site architecture. It means that you don't produce one place and then you break the parts and you put them together is actually you bring the tools and produce on site okay because uh, usually in the use of, of digital fabrication tools in, in architecture you have the machines in one side of the world where things are being produced and then you ship them and then and then you build on on site in this case you have the tool uh, the, i mean the idea this is maybe will be understood and with this Thomas, if I can just come a comment with that. For example, when you have uh, huge, huge companies who build their own factories, especially medical companies. Um, I remember I worked a lot with them when they invented Factor 7, which was something that could stop internal bleeding so you can operate on soldiers in war. And they needed to start producing this like that. So they built a, a huge factory in 12 months. But that meant they had every piece of it out in the world to make sure they could do it. So the whole world was producing to this factory. The problem is, if you do this kind of processes at the same time, then when you put the pieces together, nothing matches. There's always you know, two centimeters wrong. And, and in architecture in general, because we have the, the system that we put out tenders, uh, a lot of things get produced different places and when you put them together. So it's... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So in, in this case, not only the, the tools, but also the materials were thought to be used on site. It means that, uh, in this case, it's clay that they put in the, into the tool, but ideally, conceptually, the, I mean, the machines will be connected to the, to the same ground, and the, from the ground, you produce the raw materials, and then the, you process the materials, and then you use the, the machines to produce architecture. No? So this is just speculation about how, 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 how it could be. No? In this case, um, Berak Koshnevich and Nilich are doing research on, on how you you can 3D print on moon or in the moon or how you can 3D print on Mars. So again, it is, it's we really need to have the tools to produce architecture everywhere. No? So and, and and then in, in in this sense, we we I, I I'll show you a more traditional approach to the use of digital fabrication tools, but but at the same time has this kind of distributed uh, manufacturing concept on it. Now, in this case, the Fab Lab House is a project that we developed for the Solar Decathlon competition in 2010. And it's about it making a design of a house that they can vary depending on, on, the, on the place of the world that uh, it, could, it would be located. No? In this case, the parametric design was based on the solar path. And then the solar path was defining the maximum surface to take advantage of, uh, of the solar radiation for the production of energy. In this case, the, the competition is about creating uh, houses that they can be self-sufficient in terms of energy. But usually what you have in the competition is there were 20 universities. Usually you have 20 boxes, literally, full of technology, no? full of the most efficient solar panels, uh, super expensive machines inside, uh, inside etc. But there was not really uh, like um, a concept of design inside these boxes. No? So in this case, what we wanted to do is to put the design as a mean of production, uh, as a mean for the production of energy. It means if you take the Flan, Fran Lloyd Wright's uh, say, he says follow, follows form uh, uh, function in this case, form, 
form follows function, in this case form follows energy. No? That's quite one of the differences that we wanted to, to include in, the, in this concept of the house. So as you see this parametric model, if you put the, it was developed for Madrid, but if you put it in Reykjavik, or if you put it in Malmo, it would be more, uh, let's say, it's true to, the, to, to really take advantage of, of the sun path and have the much maximum exposure to the sun. But if you put it to the Ecuador, then the house will be totally flat. No? So that's what's the idea, that you introduce in a model the latitude and the longitude, and it will give you a different design. Then, we pro this is the space of our fab lab. We produce the house in the fab lab, and then we had to put it in, in containers and drive to Madrid. But if we would have a fab lab in Madrid, we produce the house in, in Madrid. And if you can put a machine in the bottom of the house, then you can have a house that can have babies, that can have other houses. No? And, and, and actually, this, you, you can now download this design online. It's in our wiki site, the Fab Lab house design. Um, this is how it looks interior of the house. Uh, by the way, the, the Solar Decathlon was a competition. We lost totally. Uh, we were the last ones because we were organizing parties and doing a lot of forbidden things. But we won the People's Choice Award. So if we were organizing parties, we were the people was voting us, no? So that was very funny, but the, 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 what the response that we had is that was a very human house instead of a machine, no? The other houses, you, can, you couldn't touch the fridge because it, they were going to lose points, no? In our case, people just was going inside and they feel like a very homey house, no? These are some more pictures of, uh, of the site. As you see, this is, these are the other competitors, no? As I t I'm telling you, the, we had another twenty, another sixteen here. They, they were really boxes in this case. So, from from that same concept of of having a um, a design that that would change according to the parameters inserted, we we develop a, another conceptual pavilion that uh, was thought uh, to be embedded into the city. In this case, this house, if you see it, it cannot grow. No, it, I mean, it's, it's it's one design, it's produced, and that's it. But in this case, it's, it's a design that can grow depending on the necessities of the density that you want to add. So this is a project that we developed for, for Endesa, that is one of the big electrical companies in, in Spain. I don't know why the images are looking so badly. And, and basically, all these panels, the idea, this, the idea is that they are going to be, again, oriented towards the best uh, position in relation with the sun path to take more advantage of it, in this case on Barcelona. Um, and then, yes, this is a, another video I want to show about it to, to have a better overview of a, of, a, of a project. And again, this is something that we did. Uh, we produced maybe, uh, it was like two months, really, of production. So in a way, it's, it's, it's really, really rapid prototyping of, of architecture, no, in this case. Um, Endesa is one of the biggest companies of electricity in, in, in Spain. And actually, they use the pavilion for, for a demonstrator of uh, smart cities and uh, during the Smart City Expo in 2011. No? So if you have been in Barcelona, if you have seen these b two big towers, the pavilion is just in front of those. So maybe it's the best spot of, of Barcelona. This is some prototypes that we did of, of showing this vertical growth of, of, of the pavilion itself. Huh? So at the same time, they were having, uh, they, uh, they, they were monitoring the, their, their small pilot of, of smart cities, but then also they were thinking about how we can have a house in which the house is also attached to a uh, bike or a car charger. No? So you use the energy produced by the solar panels also to charge your car, and you, use your, your, you can use your car as a battery for your house. No? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to the last two projects and I will finish. This is, uh, again, jumping up in scale. It's not only architecture, but in this scale, it's about talking about the territory. In this case, it's a, it's a project that is called the Baldaura Cell Sufficient Labs. Um, we acquired uh, 130 hectares property in the, in the middle of Barcelona. Is this? This big park is the Colcerola Park. This is the this is Yac. This is the center of Barcelona, and we are maybe a 15, 20 minute drive from here. And and this is a protected um, forest, let's say, in which we we, we found this old farmhouse uh, to be to develop a, a new project. In this case, 
We want to develop a research center, or we are developing actually, it's under construction now, in which we will have three labs. One will be the food lab, that is, will be the, the self-sufficient uh, production of, of, of food, of organic food. Um, the energy lab, is, it means that all the energy that is being used in this, in this research center is actually produced by uh, on-site, by biomass, by wind, by solar power, and, and, and so on. And then the green fab lab. It means as a fab lab with all these machines that we would, we, I, I talked to you before, but not only using the common materials, not using acrylic or plywood that is really not environmentally friendly, but actually taking the raw materials from the site. You know, this is the next challenge of, of the fab labs is that, is how we can produce our own raw materials. And this serves as a, as a research for, to do that. No? In this case, um, we are developing here also a, a, another big project with, with the, with the and it's called Energrid. That is basically the, the internet of energy. Uh, it means it's how we can monitor and, and, and actually know which is the performance of each one of the appliances in our houses. And if you think about the houses connected to another houses, maybe you can share watts with your neighbor or, or, or exchange some kilowatts by some sugar. No? So that's the next, uh, the next step, the socialization of, of energy uh, through internet. And and basically, this this project is is starting now. This picture was taken during uh, this last Tuesday, in which we did this event, and where we took uh, our students and and, and again uh, all the YAC community. Three, two, one. And what we are doing now is starting to develop the food lab. So what we did is we take all the YAC community to the, to the site. Each one was walking like uh, one hour with their trees in, the, in their back. And then we, we took the tree to one of the sites to start the, the first plantation. No? In this case, we used these balloons. This is why I showed the, the picture. We put a GoPro camera and we start to record how's the plantation going. Um, So this is based on a project that is called Balloon Mapping, developed by the Public Laboratory, that you can use actually these kind of um, uh, very basic tools to actually map the performance of the forest, of the trees, by using, if you put filters into the pictures, you can start to know how the trees feel or how your plantation is, is doing. Okay. And, 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 and basically, that's a pre-launching of, of, of this project, the Green Fab Lab, which we're going to start on the, um, next year. I'm going to finish with the Fab City. And that's uh, no, going again in scales, going from the microcontrollers to materials to architecture to the territory now to the city. No? And in this case, uh, we're working together with the City Hall of Barcelona to develop um, one of the biggest local networks of, of, of fab labs and uh, manufacturing in the city based on the same concepts that I was talking at the beginning. You know, how we can think about production into the cities again, how we can take the cities to this kind of high-tech medieval age again. And basically, we are doing it based on, on, uh, on some principles. Um, one is the historical principle of the development of the different models of the city. In this case of Barcelona, um, has like but you can identify like four times of the city or, or four um, periods of the city. One is the Roman period of the city, the medieval, the industrial, uh, maybe one of the most recognized ones, recognized ones when Ildefon Cerda made the, the big planning of the city, the last big change of Barcelona at the end of the 19th century. And then the model today maybe is the other one that is highly recognized because the Olympics of the 1992. But what we have today is a model of, of a city that basically is a city of a spectacle. No? Barcelona, basically, what is, what is now is a city of events. People come to fa have fun in Barcelona, and every other major meeting, forum, gathering, expo, etc., is happening in Barcelona. So at the end, what is leaving to Barcelona, all these things are trash, basically, again. And it's not leaving anything else as just tourism and, and very naive consumption of, of the space. So, what we think is that we would need to develop a, the fifth uh, version of Barcelona. In this case, based on these distributed manufacturing facilities in the city. This was presented by Antoni Vives, 
that is actually the deputy mayor of Barcelona today. And, and, and it's called the Fab City. No? And then basically I wanted to share with you that we are now installing these two new Fab Labs. One is in one of the richest, richest areas of Barcelona inside of an old, uh, inside of a library. So it means also they, they talk about the libraries of the future. No? The libraries usually had books, then maybe 20 years ago they started to have computers. And then now the, the, the libraries could, maybe should be thought as also places where you can have machines to make things. No? The, not only providing the knowledge and the connectivity to the world, but also providing the tools to, to make things. In this case is the Fab Lab de las Corts will be um, what is called Ateneu de Fabricación. Um, um, it, it's going to be inside of a library that has a Fab Lab. And the Ciutat Meridiana one is, is one of the poorest areas of Barcelona. It's inside of a special school. Or, or a special sc a school. It's a school for disadvantaged kids and in which we, ha we will have a lot of challenges related with immigration and with unemployment and, and so on. No? So the Fab Lab could be used as a dynamizer of, of, of this kind of new um, a scenario in, in, in the place. Now, and this is a photo for last week. It's that same school in which, as you see, this is like kind of a typical advertisement of a, of a government in which they are announcing that something is happening there. And what is happening there is a fab lab, which is kind of a miracle for us. And, and this is the, the vision of the next six years to have at least one fab lab for each neighborhood of, uh, for, per each district of Barcelona. And with that, that's it. Thank you very much. That was beautiful, Thomas. Um, it's so interesting with this whole movement. I remember eight years ago, an engineer from India showed me the first open source uh, blueprints I ever saw. He showed me, uh, he came from India, he was working in the United States, he was extremely talented. And he had a grandmother who needed a wheelchair, and that's really, really expensive at that time in India. Uh, so he showed me blueprints where him and another friend put up on the web. This is how you can build a wheelchair for no money and just kind of taking apart things. He also showed an iPad, uh, no, sorry, an iPod, which hadn't reached its height of uh, hype at that time. But he said, we can actually do an iPad, uh, an iPod with very small things. It's not going to be as design nice. But functionality is going to be the same. Exactly. And this whole open source, can we build stuff movement now gotten so big that it's accessible to many, many people and it's kind of spread um, from just the people who were able to do it and now spreading out into the world. I think it's really, really inspiring. We don't know where it's going to happen. No. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> so okay. let's take uh, two questions for Thomas and then we move on to the next Fab Lab. Just uh, yeah, to uh, a comment on a question, basically. I thought uh, this, um, when you uh, talked about architecture and making uh, your own bricks uh, and show the parametric wall, I just wonder about the um, stuff like raw material. Like for example, uh, here in the south of Sweden, you can basically take a shovel and start digging and you, you find clay. Mm -hmm. and you can make your own bricks like, like that with your yeah. hands. More or less, you have to burn it, and it, that costs a lot of energy, of course. But, yeah. uh, but how, how do you see this? Um, so that was the comment. Here's the question. <laughs> you, you, you started out with comparing it to uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, and that kind of changed everything. That changed the, how you, we produce food, how we produce water, how we produce like basic necessities. So how do you see this uh, fabrication movement Mm -hmm. How can it scale to that level of like revolution, yeah. where it starts affecting those kind of basic necessities? Yeah, uh, I think in a in a way is one uh, one part of that one answer of that question is we are actually nor we are not inventing anything new. We are actually going back to what we we used to do. That we were used to produce food. We were used to solve our own needs with the tools that we have accessible by the time. No? The first settlements of the human settlements are always happen around water and the, well, the best conditions for agriculture and so on. I mean, we had this implied in, in, in our genes in a way. The thing is that the, w during the last 100 years mainly, we had been, been unlinked 
from those facts of what it means to be seated on a chair, what it means to be dressed as we are dressed, or we, what it means to be using the tools that we use. We take it from granted, for granted. No, we buy them from 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 the shelf. No, we we choose things and we we buy them. What what I think is that, and, and by giving this these tools again, uh, or, or giving the accessibility to these tools, is really being connected to that way of production again, no? and being connected to to that information that is in our genes. What I think, though, is that we don't need to pretend that we are cavemen. It means that if we, in terms of commodities, we achieved uh, some things thanks to technology. I mean, we can take the, the good things from the industrialization and take them. I mean, it's, it's not bad to use industrial tools to take water to get it to our homes. It doesn't mean that you need to 3D print each part of your pipe, or it doesn't mean that you need to use a MakerBot to produce uh, um, uh, screws or things like that. What, we, what I think about this is like a kind of a plug-in. I, I, I think that we are making an upgrade in the way that we relate with our, ourselves, with the things that we use, and with the um, things that we need. No, um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's that it's not a revolution that everything is going to, and then we are coming with a totally new thing. I think it's, it's an upgrade, and this is why maybe the word revolution is. I, I use it, and, I th and a lot of people is using it, but history history will tell. But uh, maybe it's not the proper one. I think it will be like more. It's more like an upgrade. <laughs> Thank you. We have to move on, so maybe you talk to Thomas in the break. 